Dane Servine has a new book called The World is God's Language, also published by 16 Rivers Press. Dane's other recent books include Earth is a Fickle Dancer, published by Main Street Rag, and The Gateless Gate, Polishing the Moon Sword, published by Saddle Road Press. Dane's poems have won awards from Adrian Rich, Tony Hoagland, The Atlanta Review, Cesara, and been nominated for two push carts. His work appears in The Sun, The Hudson Review, Tri-Quarterly, Poetry Flash, Catamaran, Miramar, Rattle, and The Sycamore Review, and Pedestal Magazine and others. Dane lives in Santa Cruz, California. Visit his website as daneservine.typepad.com. Please put your hands together for Dane Servine. Hey, everybody. Really great to be here. Um, you know, Stella and I have been making the rounds reading together with our, our new books from this year. And it's been such a delight to, um, through those readings, to get to meet so many uh, poets around the Bay Area and, and the country. I particularly want to thank Sandy, of course, and Diane Mumi for hosting um, this particular series, and to 16 Rivers Press for it's, I'm one of the newer members and um, have really been grateful to enter this um, collegial community of fellow writers. Um, so the, the new book out you might be able to see is The World is God's Language. Um, thought the cover came out very nicely. Um, it's actually a Simone Vale quote. And in the book's preface, it's a collection of little paired prose poems. And in the preface, just to set the stage, I make mention of my debt to um, the marvelous prose poem maestro Gary Young from the University of California at Santa Cruz. And his um, ushering in, in my mind, a kind of Japanese style short form, a kind of blended American haiku and haibun, creating a new poetic focus for readers and writers like me. Uh, but the other influences in, my, in, my, in this particular book is Simone Weil, a French philosopher, mystic, and a political activist who wrote, um, attention is a kind of prayer. And it's a perspective that you might say uh, fills these pages. Um, the Buddhist teacher Kukai, who taught that the world itself is made up of a pictorial alphabet of image letters, or monji, spelling out the universe body to any who would read it. And poetry is one of those forms of, of alphabet. So that just gives you, sets the stage a little bit. Um, I thought I would open with, um, each time I do a reading, I try and find a thread through the many diverse poems in the book. The, Poems start with personal history, moves out to the rest of the world and some of my travels there. And so tonight it's gonna to be a little bit about desire. So the first poem in the book, it, you should know I'm a therapist by trade also. So you'll hear a little bit of Jung and Freud show up in this stuff. Uh, the first poem is entitled Breast. It was in some obscure motel room, cheap, and I was young. But there it was, luminous orb falling from my mother's bra as she changed clothes in close quarters. I had no memory of infant days, swell of milk, suckle of nipple, no glimpse of the days yet to come. All I knew in one moment was how it begins, the shape of loss, its sweet curve. Now, moving then from the early experiences of mother to the father, you know, if you're a therapist, that's always ripe territory for all of us, it seems like. Um, this one's entitled Communion. My father was a preacher. At age five, I was too embarrassed to follow the others to the altar where he gave communion. But afterward, my body crumpled into his as he soothed and brought me alone 
behind the choir benches, the organ, the towering cross, to the room where bits of bread remain on the silver tray. I hungered for him, my remote father dressed in Sunday black. So when he pressed the crumbs into my hand, the purple stain to my lips said, this is my body, this is my blood. I took him inside, believing. And part of the imagery, which I've heard is a little confusing. This is, you know, my dad was a great guy, a little remote. He was not among the Catholic priests who did bad things to little boys behind the uh, altar. This is, this is imagery of how profound father and son relationships are at some core uh, level. But of course, I'm 65 now, a young pup still, I've heard. Um, and, um, you know, going back to the first page, these are kind of paired poems. So I wrote one called Secret Lover, which might be addressing this early longing somehow. Secret Lover. I wake wrapped in my own arms, hand having found bare shoulder under shirt. Embarrassed, I start to withdraw my limbs, but then linger in this embrace. Who else could love me from the inside out? I'm gonna flip ahead on this notion of desire and read um, a poem that one of, one of our um, fellow um, 16 Rivers poets, Elliot Shane works with um, adolescents like I did for many years in Santa Cruz. And I think we both kind of bonded around this um, poetic experience of the youth that we deal with. Uh, this one's entitled Modern Hero. The blonde curled college kid stands alone on the roof stares out to sea, his green baseball cap askew, his black Metallica t-shirt untucked, beer held absently between two fingers. The ocean, like his discontent, knows no bounds. He is measuring the quest, how far he must go with no timber, no compass, no sail. I think one of the things Elliot and I have been so struck by is, you know, it's the, it's sometimes the uh, worst kids in the class. It's the rabble rousers who have within them something to be great if they could just find a way. Um, you know, right above that poem on a, maybe a larger scale um, is something similar. Uh, it's called Magellan's Voyage around the world. I took this from a scrap of history that I was reading. When the last biscuit was gone, they scraped the maggots out of the casks, mashed and served them as gruel, then made cakes out of sawdust soaked with the urine of rats. The rats themselves as delicacies had long since been hunted to extinction, but oh, the wonder of that unknown world. There on the horizon, pineapple, mangoes, hope, worth any distance, any deprivation. And unfortunately, any degree of colonialism that came at, at the end of that particular quest. But there's something in human beings that always seems to move and be in movement. I, I, I love Carl Sagan. I read a lot of his work and he's so fabulous about talking about at the core of the cell and the core of the universe itself is this thing that one might call desire. So on that same theme, um, this poem is called Broken Desire. Um, when I, years ago, when I was traveling with my children um, over in Italy um, and, you know, the role of art as a bearer of desire. Um, and so this little piece of history really struck me, broken desire. Pope Pius IX decided the sight of male genitalia on sculpture might incite lust. 
so with chisel and mallet, had the penises of every male statue inside Vatican City hacked off. Works by Michelangelo, Bramante, Bernini, hundreds of fig leaves now covering each emasculation, as though desire could be eviscerated from our bodies or covered by such tender, slender leaves. And then this is a little strange one. It was published in an obscure magazine and it's a dream image, um, but I just felt like I should read it. It says something I think about desire. Do I wake or sleep? In my dream, Nietzsche emerges unshaven from a Nazi railroad car, empty now of its human cargo, announces that God is dead. Of course, the existentialists lived before Hitler, but history is a dream run backward and dreams are a way of catching up with history. So I tell him as I wake that he promised a Superman in his future a human marvel that God's death would make room for. But he only sighs, points his weary finger at me as I disappear and wake again into this world of sleeping gods. There's something even in Carl Sagan where he, he talks about the, um, the latent something in us that we don't know what it will quite be yet. And we're such an early species, we're so young that we don't quite know yet what we're gonna be when we grow up. Um, there is a section of um, poems that were, again, I had the privilege of, we, we traveled, have traveled with another family to Costa Rica and Bali, and our kids got to you know, experience all of that. And in Bali came a, a whole series of poems, um, and I was wanted to read this one called Strange Beauty. Our Bali guide brushes his hand over the bark of the jackfruit tree, shows us knife marks children have made. They collect the sap that oozes from the wound on long, thin branches and then stalk dragonflies. After they run laughing to mothers with their delicious prisoners, roast them over coals, pop crackling dragons into their open mouths. It is a lush world, each wound a strange beauty. And I think in Carl Sagan's world, as well as the Hindu Buddhist Balinese, there's, there's a sense of being a part of something dark and ominous and luscious and wonderful, and it's all of that. Um, I'll read the title poem, The World is God's Language, which is the first poem in the Bali series. Um, what, one of the um, anecdotes I found really interesting is one of the most educated and highest paid positions in Bali is, are the tourist guides who have to be trained in five or six different languages. They have to be trained in local histories and colonialist histories. And they are these wealth of, they're such storytellers. So one time Andy, the guy told me this story. Andy tells us how the best coffee in Bali comes from beans eaten by a fox, passed through undigested, roasted, sold at exorbitant prices, that the whole banana tree is used for food, baskets, prayers. Everything in Bali has both use and spirit, even the careening motor scooter at the curb, adorned with bamboo prayer baskets filled with red hibiscus petals. I was very impressed about how they approached their uh, motor scooters. I could have said, ah, I want to get away from that. And it's like they had 
these perfect prayer baskets that were a part of their ritual. Um, so I'm gonna, that's this book. If you'd like to find, I'm gonna read a couple more poems just from a couple other selections, but go to 16 Rivers Press, just go to 16 Rivers Press and you'll be able to sign up for our benefit reading coming next week. And uh, look for not only Stella's and my books, but Terry's and Barbara's and other, um, other press members. Um, and when in doubt, if you want to find me, I have a weird name. Sandy and I were talking about you know, strange spellings and pronunciations. So just Google my name and my website, Dane Servine Writes, will pop up. And you can see a lot of free samples of work and so on. But this. Um, the last two poems, this one um, I was going to read, and then Diane Frank pops up in the audience. Um, so Earth is a Fickle Dancer is the title poem to one of my last books, but it's also included in the marvelous um, Fog and Light anthology about um, San Francisco. So you can take a peek there also. Earth is a Fickle Dancer. Talk about desire desires in the very continents that move underneath us. At the Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, there is a fluid map of the world where one can spin the silver toggle with a finger, watch familiar continents swim like fish round a globe I thought reliable. Once a single vast ocean we now call Panthalassa surrounded the supercontinent Pangaea in the Southern Hemisphere. This restless earth always moving, tectonic plates cavorting, the Americas thrown from Africa, India a leaping dancer thrust at the immovable body of the Himalayas, the shifting floor between California and the Appalachians flooded with new seas. Inch the dial, one million years, not much changes, a new isthmus here, a new mountain there, but spin the silver disc like the six-year-old who muscles his way in between my torso and the luminous map saying, let me see, let me see. And the world reveals itself as the flamingo dancer it is, the hem of her dress bunched in hand like the Alps, toe of her boot spinning my leaden feet nimble oceans flooding into the breach of Gibraltar with one blink of her Mediterranean eyes. And if you want to live this poem, go to the Academy of Sciences and just in the foyer, you'll find this map and you can do the little thing. I'll end with, um, I really like this. This was a marvelous collaboration. I've, I'm um, part of a Zen group. Um, that is very interested in the arts. And I was given the task of kind of taking the 48 uh, traditional Zen koans of the gateless gate and writing a contemporary poem in response, which seems very arrogant, but apparently there's a long history of doing so over the centuries. So I was like, all right, I'll do it. So just to give you a sample, um, koan 46 is a very famous one um, called Step Forward from the Top of a Pole basically where the master says, from the top of a pole, 100 feet high, how do you step forward? I had no idea, but here's the poem that came called Mud Zen. I love the view at the top, half dome in Yosemite, immense granite towering above the tiny redwoods in the valley, the Empire State Building's terraced roof asphalt streets, the cacophony of cabs far below. I've heard the upper 1% of the upper 1% have so much money, it becomes almost meaningless, like the endless blue atop Mount Everest, the rest of the world so far away, you can't touch it. I like the meditation joke about the seeker who finally manages after so much to attain the peak finds the yogi sitting serenely amid pure snow, white clouds, unimpeded views, sits down and waits for it to happen, enlightenment, all the rest. After a while, the yogi opens an eye, 
looks over at the eager aspirant, finally says, this is it, everything else is happening down there. The top of the pole is a tiny platform from which to gaze at the world. Every day, my three-year-old mind calls to me from the mud with a blueberry stained face, wants me to make dark pies in the earth's body. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dane, that was so beautiful. I'm going to invite everyone to unmute so that we can have some live feedback. How about some applause? Thank you for listening. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Oh my God, it was great, loved it, I loved it. Wonderful. Awesome.